Thank you. Thank you. I'm just so happy to see you all. Welcome, everyone. This event made me look way back over my career. There are people here from various stages of my journey who lit my way. I'm delighted you traveled here to Washington to share this evening with me. Thank you so much. I'm grateful to my family, especially my wife, Donna, who has encouraged my personal quest with wisdom and good humor these many, many, many years. I wish I had the words to express my love for my sons, but I believe they feel it in their hearts. As I looked into the past three or four decades and jotted down some ideas about what to say to you, I realized that from when I was a medical student to today, there has been a huge shift in the practice of medicine and even in society at large regarding healthcare. When I became a doctor, by tradition, medical practice was passive. We waited for patients to arrive when they needed help and often were very sick. We kept records in longhand that was often illegible on paper, and we stored them sometimes haphazardly only in the office or hospital where the patient received care. There were vast differences in quality of care from place to place. Communications between patients and doctors, between doctors and staff, between medical specialists, or even to the pharmacists were often perplexing, not to mention the payment labyrinth. The first patient I had as an intern, the very first patient, Mrs. Wilson, probably had a length of stay way beyond what was necessary. And it wasn't just because it was New York. <laughs> I remember my daily pleadings with my senior resident, daily pleadings, to keep her for yet another day of observation. She was so frail. And she was going home to some anonymous Brooklyn, New York apartment building. How would she manage? How would she manage? Well, the day came when I could no longer stave off the inevitable. Suppressing my anxiety, I wrote down everything for Mrs. Wilson and her daughter, and I sent her home. I think I called her every day for a week to make sure she was just alive. And then I made sure that she came back to my clinic slot, which was weeks away. Well, Mrs. Wilson did come back to see me as appointed. She wore her Sunday best with a beautiful hat on and she had put on lipstick. She left with a bounce in her step, and she had a very good outcome. But as idealistic as I was, I couldn't do that for every patient. The truth is, doctors rarely knew how patients fared under our care, not to mention what happened to them when they stepped out the door. In the outpatient setting, the average patient interacted with us four times a year, four times a year. The average visit was 15 minutes. That is one hour a year, one hour a year. Barely enough time to address the main issues for the visits, let alone to dive into the factors in our patients' lives that might influence their total health. Definitely, there was not enough time to ask our patients about their care experience or about their care preferences. Back then, and even until a few years ago, it was difficult to find out if patients were able to navigate the complexity of the healthcare system and to get what they needed to stay healthy. Without registries to track our patients' progress, we were largely unaware of gaps in their care. Did they follow the prescribed regimen? Was their blood pressure controlled? Were the preventive tests done? What were other doctors telling them to do? Months would go by, months would go by until the follow-up visit, and we would begin all over again from the start to find out what was going wrong. Nowhere was this more apparent than in the big city emergency room I ran briefly. The ER 
was an emotional, high adrenaline setting. The heroic saves and tragic losses would come in choppy waves. And in such a high definition environment, the lost opportunities to intervene earlier in the lives of our patients were just all too obvious. Over the years, we gradually became oriented to addressing the therapeutic, preventive, and lifestyle changes that could lead to a healthier life. And yet most of us were still unaware of the costs in dollars of healthcare. In short, we were all flying blind. We were working hard with the best of intentions in our institutions or our offices in the hope that we were making a difference for our patients and collectively for the populations and the communities we served. But we didn't have any way to know for sure. However, over these past few decades, we also have been reevaluating how healthcare should be delivered, partly because of advances in medical science, partly because of ethical questions, and partly due to the digital electronics revolution. Gradually, we have put changes in place. In every care setting in my career, I yearn for the tools that we have in our systems today. Now, we can hold up the mirror to our performance, take responsibility for shortcomings, and to design team and systems approaches to do better. We've learned that it makes a crucial difference when we pay attention to what is important to our patients, when we use our relationships with them to help them make choices, the right choices, about important matters like what they eat or how they exercise or whether they smoke, or when we engage people to help them adhere to proven preventive measures to get their cancer screening and control their cholesterol and blood pressure. When we honestly track and address gaps in care and when we build teams to coordinate follow-ups, we see that patients and families are much more likely to stay healthy and productive. We've learned that the importance of paying special attention to the comfort and the dignity of our patients at the end of their lives. When I was a clinician training in hospital settings, I always thought that complications were an inevitable byproduct of the therapeutic process. I never thought that there would be a day when we would be all striving to, for zero hospital-associated complications, for zero. I certainly never thought that we would stand a chance of achieving such a lofty goal. And yet, our field is beginning to see dramatic reductions in hospital-acquired infections, reductions in ventilator-associated pneumonias, reductions in hospital-acquired hospital -acquired pressure ulcers, medication errors, hospital falls. Hundreds of us have gotten to zero and have maintained the vigilance and have laid the foundation for a high reliability medical culture where such breakdowns in patient care are simply not tolerated. Our patients are safer, but we all have much more work to do, but it is the right work. An essential part of embracing the triple aim to improve the health of our population to improve the care experience of individuals and families, and to find the most efficient way to do so is a subtle but monumental shift in our perspective. We're getting better at fostering the health of our patients, but our delivery systems are still amazingly passive. We are largely still waiting for our patients to come to us with symptoms or illnesses to initiate the care. And for a field so couched in scientific breakthroughs and evidence of effectiveness, we frequently operate with relatively little information. To embrace the triple aim, our system has to become more proactive. And to be proactive, we must rely on total visibility into performance. And we must truly create partnerships with patients and communities. Ask doctors and hospitals why we do not get better results for our patients. And for the first response you are likely to hear is that 
patients do not take responsibility for their health. Of course patients have to be responsible, but helping patients and communities achieve optimum health is a societal and systems responsibility. If we put ourselves in our patients' shoes, the need to transform our care delivery system becomes ever so obvious. My mother lived a long and fulfilling life. She died a few years ago at the age of 92. Most of us have had the experience of going through the healthcare system with our parents or our friends and our loved ones. And we, all, we know all too well the confusion and the fragmentation and even the indifference to patients that can be found there. I myself had to reconcile my mother's sometimes contraindicated medications. My sister discovered the stage four pressure ulcer that had developed when my mother was in a well-respected academic geriatric center service. And my sister lovingly provided the tender nursing care for six months until it healed. With no one to advise us in the hospital, it was our family that had, that had to hold the end of life and quality of care conversations that defined her last month, months of life at home. Now, everyone who took care of my mother worked hard to solve her problems while she was in the hospital, but taking stock of the larger picture was definitely up to us. Today, we have more and more electronic tools. We have mobile applications, patient registries, and, pa and population care management systems. We've begun to, to use these tools to monitor our performance objectively. And we have been forced to face the facts. We haven't been doing as well as we thought. New, more thorough measures of performance force us to confront the huge gaps the huge gaps between what we want to achieve and what is really happening. Objective measures of performance and subjective responses from patients have given us a new point of view, looking at care from the patient's and the community's perspective. Until now, engrossed in pressing matters at hand, we in the healthcare system haven't been able to make out the larger picture. To be sure, as our healthcare world is rapidly evolving, the difficulties are real. Old, familiar financing mechanisms are changing, and most of us are really feeling squeezed. We are assuming responsibility for a broader array of outcomes for patients than we're used to. Oversight committees, audits, regulations seem to creep out of every corner, gobbling up time and resources. Finally, there is a lot, a lot of information coming at us, much of it undifferentiated. The noise, the noise is deafening. To borrow a phrase from writer and statistician Nate Silver, how can we find the signal, how can we find the signal in this cacophony to guide us to the pathway to a healthier tomorrow. The signal isn't buried in the myriad problems and irritants that make our lives as providers more challenging. The true signal, the true signal, the North Star that can help guide, uh, guide our actions is the answer to the question, what is in the best interest of our patients and by extension, our communities? To steer by that North Star we have to see patients' needs from their perspective and pilot our systems along that course. Six years ago, the American Hospital Association introduced an industry-wide framework, Health for Life, Health for Life. Today, key elements of that framework are materializing. We're still short of health care for all, but a significant portion of Americans who had no health insurance and so no access to care will actually have coverage. Most of us are in the process of putting in place key information systems that will give us the objective basis to coordinate care and address gaps in care for the populations we serve. We are on the cusp 
of payment reform that will place financial incentives squarely on the goal of achieving the triple aim. Doctors and hospitals, and yes, in some cases, health plans are coming together to organize systems of care. Now, the next few years will be very, very, very messy. We will see a lot of disruption before we settle into a new world, a new order. But we can be optimistic. We can be optimistic. Our frame of reference, as our frame of reference acquires a broader perspective, we will create valuable new tools to manage patient care and control diseases. Social media, ever more sophisticated information and analytics, mobile communication and monitoring devices are providing us with enormous opportunities, enormous capabilities. Capabilities to proactively engage patients, patient networks, and community resources in pursuit of our total health agenda. We are creating an environment where we all have a decent chance of working for the right outcomes for our patients and for our communities. But it is up to us, to all of us, to transform our care delivery systems and to capitalize on all these opportunities. If we embrace these opportunities, we will have a very good shot at finally realizing our vision of a society of healthy communities where every individual all individuals can reach their highest potential for health. It is an age of transition, and we are lucky, we are lucky enough to be in it, seeing it happen, and fortunate to be in a position to be making some of the decisions for improvement. It's invigorating. Working among you all, I am optimistic. I'm optimistic. Now, you all may be having second thoughts at this time about choosing someone so thoroughly optimistic to be your chair. <laughs> but as difficult and baffling as these times are, particularly as we implement a sweeping new healthcare law, I'm here to tell you that things are changing for the better. Things are changing for the better. One of the greatest privileges of serving on the American Hospital Association board is the opportunity it offers board members to travel and speak to so many of you working with communities, diverse communities, all over the country. My conversations with you convince me that I am not alone in my optimism. There are just as many crazy people out there as I am. <laughs> right? Our field, our field is rallying around and embracing the challenge of achieving the triple aim. Better health for our communities, better care and care experience for our patients, better value for our society with the health care dollars we spend. So thank you. I want to really thank you all for entrusting me with the honor of serving you as chair of your board of trustees in this absolutely crucial period of transformation. Thank you, everyone.